Hey guys, welcome back to the Psalms to God YouTube channel. We are back with Breakfast and Bible. I'm sorry I'm not showing my face, but still working on my backgrounds and my setup and all that stuff. So we're just going to look at the notebook today. And today we're going to talk about Hagar. Now I gave it the subtitle, The Single Mother, even though Hagar really wasn't a single mother. Um, Abraham was there for the rearing of Ishmael for at least most of his life. But over time, some of the things that happen, um, I think a lot of people associate Hagar with the struggle of being a single mother. And I think it's something that single mothers probably can relate to. But also, I think because she does end up getting kind of pushed out of the family, eventually she probably did live as a single mother. So that's why I gave it the subtitle, Hagar the Single Mother. Um, before we jump in, I do want to throw out a disclaimer. It's been a while since I've done the Breakfast and Bible series and showed this notebook. So I just want to remind people that these stickers are for decorative purposes only. They are not meant to actually represent people of the Bible. I don't know what Hagar looked like. Um, I don't know how old or young, how tall or skinny or fat um, she may have been, how dark or light how curly or not curly her hair was, um, though Hagar was an Egyptian, so that should tell us some things. But that being said, I have stickers throughout this book of variety of races, heights, colors, shapes, etc. for what I could find. And so they're just meant to be decorative, not, yeah. So just throwing that disclaimer out there for those who are not familiar with my notebook, or who are new to the channel or who have forgotten. So let's talk about Hagar. The story of Hagar is really given in Genesis 16 and then it continues on a little later in Genesis 21. And so one of the first things I always like to do when I go back and look at people from the Bible is not only to just look at their story as a whole but also to look up their name. A lot of the biblical people had names with meaning. Um, even today, technically, our names have meaning, but I think that people are more likely to just choose names because they're popular or they're pretty or they like the way they sound. Um, but back then, a lot of times, people were named something for a specific reason. Now, Hagar is actually Egyptian. And so when I looked up the name Hagar um, in Strong's Concordance, it didn't actually give a meaning for the name Hagar. It, mentioned that it was probably a foreign origin which means it's probably of Egyptian origin and I'd probably have to go do some digging in probably um, either Arabic or some other language I'm not sure what language was being spoken in Egypt at the time of Abraham so I would probably have to go back and do some looking into that to figure out exactly what it meant but I did see some evidence that the name Hagar has been associated with flight in Hebrew. And so um, that's probably due to what actually happens in the story concerning Hagar. So I think in Hebrew, when people name their kids Hagar, it probably means flight to them just because of what Hagar endured. So that's the name Hagar. Now, Let's go over Hagar's story. Just a recap for those who have forgotten or a little fuzzy um, on who she is and what her significance is in the Bible. So Hagar was the handmaid of Sarah. So she essentially was a servant um, for in Abraham's household, specifically under Sarah. And when Sarah, as she got older and older and she didn't have any kids, Sarah was the first person in the Bible to get this crazy idea that she would just give her husband a, another woman and that woman would be the one to give them kids. So Hagar gives, I mean, yeah, Hagar is given to Abraham by Sarah and becomes Abraham's concubine. And then she becomes the mother of Ishmael, who is Abraham's first son. Um, and after Hagar gives birth to Ishmael. There is a very rocky period between her and Sarah. Um, and this kind of escalates until she is eventually demoted back to being a mere servant. 
And then after Isaac is born, um, there is some more friction between her and Sarah and, and also between Isaac and Ishmael, more so between Ishmael and Isaac, because Isaac was basically a baby. But um, this basically boiled, came to a boiling point, at which point Hagar was sent away. Um, and this is where, again, I say that she probably experienced life as a single mother after then. Though we do see Ishmael comes back for Abraham's funeral, so there probably was still some contact between the two of them. Um, and between uh, Ishmael and his father. But essentially, she was cast out as a single mother. And that's um, not exactly the end of her story, but that's kind of where we leave off seeing her. And so there are so many things about Hagar's story. I, I really wish people preached about Hagar more often because there are some really beautiful things. There are some really sad things. And there are some things that I just have questions about. Um, and I don't think that I will be able to answer all of the questions um, in this episode because I am not, you know, I haven't in intensely studied this. I would like to take more time to study this. But I'm just going to go over some of the things that I have asked, some of the things I have found, some of the things I still wonder, right? So when I think about the story of Hagar, there are a couple of questions that automatically pop into my head. And the first one is like, what exactly was a handmaid? One thing that I think um, is really a struggle as we study the Bible is that there are a lot of words that are maybe modern words that are or have context in our modern society that may not, it, there may not be a one-on-one -on -one or one-to-one -one parallel with what was happening in the past. And when you start talking about servitude, slavery, you know, bond servants, handmaids, things like that, I think it's very hard to get a clear picture of what was happening in Abraham's day. Because the fact is there have always been servants and there have always been slaves, but it hasn't always looked the same and every culture hasn't treated it the same way. There was a time when servitude and slavery was simply someone being poor and it may or may not have been brutal. It may or may not have been that this person was considered less than human, or maybe they were just a servant, the same way you might have a maid today or a butler or something like that. Um, but over time, of course, particularly for those of us in the United States, like myself, and as a, you know, clearly I'm a black person in the United States, then a lot of times when we start thinking about servitude and slavery, it starts to get mingled in with our ideas of the Atlantic slave trade and slavery in the United States, which of course was a brutal affair and was based solely on skin color and not about whether or not someone couldn't afford to feed their family or not. Um, and rights were stripped from people. People were seen as less than human. People were sold. Their kids were sold. Families were separated. This is a very different type of, of enslavement and servitude than what may have been going on during Abraham's time. So when it says that Hagar was a handmaid, does that mean that she was simply someone who helped Sarah and she was, you know, she was just there because they were feeding her and they were taking care of her? Or does it mean that she was like enslaved and they were like beating her and like, you know, she had no other place to go, right? Those are kind of the questions that come to mind. Another question that comes into mind, which is kind of a derivative of the first question, is how much choice did she have in this matter? Like, we know that Sarah came up with this idea. Sarah was like, oh, yeah, like, I can't have a kid. So, hey, you should go have a kid with my husband, which sounds absolutely crazy in our modern day. But, of course, having kids was one of the biggest markers of success in a marriage and for a woman in that time. So Sarah was desperate. Um, but the thing is, when when Sarah came up with this idea, you know, was Hagar like, yeah, sure, that sounds cool. I'd love to sleep with your husband. Or was she like, have you lost your mind? I don't want to do that, right? Like, what was Hagar's 
take on this? Did she have a choice? Did she not have a choice? Um, what, you know, what was going through her head? We're not really given a lot of Hagar's point of view concerning how she ended up going from being the servant to being the concubine and the father of, you know, the quote unquote master's child. And so that's, that's another question. Um, and then lastly, um, there is, like I mentioned, there's friction between Hagar and Sarah. And I always have to go back and read the exact details when I'm thinking about the story, because I always wonder to myself, was Hagar actually actively doing something to Sarah that warranted her being kicked out of the house? Or was Sarah just jealous? Was she just insecure about the fact that Hagar had had a baby and she had not? And now Abraham had a child through this woman and, you know, she just felt a way. Like, was it jealousy or was there actually things happening where, you know, Hagar got the big head because she had a baby, right? So those are the main questions that pop into my head. And I'm sure there are more questions if I have sat down and spent even more time going through the text and going through the material. But I also didn't want to make this episode too long. I wanted to ease back into uh, the Women of the Bible series. So we're just going to talk about those three points. Plus a little bit at the end, we're going to go into some of the really cool things that I found in this story. So first I looked up the definition of handmaid and it literally just says a female servant who attends the lady of the house it doesn't say that she was or wasn't a slave it doesn't say that they weren't slaves but it doesn't say that they were it specifically uses the word servant which could be a paid attendant um also like i said back then there was no such thing as um you know like food stamps or welfare or section 8 so a lot of times uh, servitude was for poor people. So if you couldn't afford to feed yourself, if you couldn't afford to house yourself, to clothe yourself, then those people would end up in servitude. And so it's not necessarily like um, that she was seen as a, a lesser human or that she wasn't considered a person so much as she probably did things for Sarah to earn her keep because they were taking care of her. Um, that is the, 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 I guess the rosy thing. It is possible that they mistreated her. Um, there is, there are verses in the Bible where it says Sarah dealt harshly with her because there was this conflict and this confrontation between them. So clearly there was a, a gap, you know, right? Like a difference between being a servant and being the lady of the house. Um, the question is just how much was that? And I don't think that's something that we will ever really be able to just put a finger on and be like, this is what it was. Um, one thing I did find that was interesting as I was looking up what a handmaid is, I did see things that said that um, there are people who believe that Hagar was in Egypt and when Abraham and Sarah came to Egypt and they had their whole little thing there where Abraham lied to, to Pharaoh and all this transpired, if you remember when Abraham and Sarah leave, they are given wealth and servants and goods. And some people believe that Hagar was one of the servants who came back with them. Um, that makes so much sense, but I actually never thought about that until I was doing this study. I never really thought about the fact that she was Egyptian and they had gone to Egypt and you know basically left Egypt with spoils of the land. So that was interesting to me. Now, about her choice in the matter, this is also something that we really can't directly pinpoint. This is another thing where you can't just be like, this is what it was, because the Bible doesn't say, you know, she was forced. It doesn't say that Hagar jumped for joy and was excited. We really aren't told how this went down, but there are a couple of things to keep in mind. So... First and foremost, Hagar was considered a servant, but when she became a concubine, she was basically a lesser wife. And that is a step up socially um, and, you know, in general. 
so she basically, in a sense, kind of gained her freedom in a way by becoming um, Abraham's second wife. Um, and we see this even more explicitly with Bilhah and Zilpah, who were the handmaids of Rachel and Leah that ended up becoming wives of Jacob. And throughout the text, the word wife is used like eventually for these two ladies and they are treated as wives of Jacob and they follow the family and they go with the family. And it seems that they just became third and fourth wives as opposed to staying in the position of servant. So with that being said, Hagar may have been like, yeah, this is a great opportunity to no longer be a servant, right? Um, and so she may have wanted to do this. Um, and she may have also, we don't know what the relationship was between her and Sarah before she had the baby. She may have really pitied Sarah. She may have been like, yeah, I'll do whatever I can for you. Um, if I can have a child for you, like that, you know, that would be my honor, et cetera, et cetera. We don't really know how she was feeling going into that. So those are that's something to consider. Um, another thing that I think is very important to remember is that throughout the Bible, there are, in fact, explicit discussions of sexual assault. Um, we talked about those in the last series, which we're not going to go back into. And so the fact that there's no language within Genesis, um, within the rest of the Bible, to suggest that Hagar was forced into the situation um, it, to me, leans towards the interpretation that Hagar had some amount of choice in this matter and that she chose to do this and that it wasn't a, you know, forced thing. Now, you can argue, like, she may have been afraid, she may not have had anywhere else to go, but, you know, I do think she had some level of autonomy in deciding what would happen in this situation and i don't think it was just completely forced upon her so there is that now on to this question of jealousy right like what really happened between hagar and sarah and sarah so in the very end when Sarah actually ends up sending her away, it's actually not Hagar's fault. Um, what happens, the straw that breaks, breaks the camel's back is given in Genesis chapter 21, verse nine. And it says, and Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, which she had born unto Abraham, mocking. And then she says to Abraham, Cast out this bondwoman and her son, for the son of this bondwoman shall not be heir with my son, even with Isaac. So basically, Ishmael was mocking someone, whether he was mocking um, Sarah, whether he was mocking Isaac. I've always taken this to mean he was mocking Isaac because... Um, there, you know, th this whole scenario follows um the the tale of sarah having isaac and him coming to love isaac and and all of this stuff so i think that ishmael was kind of mocking isaac or maybe he was mocking sarah sarah didn't like it and so she wanted him put out because she wanted all the attention on her son as opposed to on um, ishmael which, you know, there's a whole conversation to be had about Sarah's reaction and how Sarah kind of put herself in this position and then took things out on Hagar, which again is what I'm, which is the question I always end up with is like, was it really Hagar's fault or was Sarah just being petty because, you know, she was struggling to have a child. So then she did this crazy thing that wasn't of good sound judgment in the first place. Then she, you know, tried to like sweep it under the rug and get rid of it. And I think, I mean, we're, we're going to focus more on Hagar today, but just food for thought to keep in the back of your mind. 
that's also a very relatable thing, how we get ourselves into stuff and then we don't want to deal with the consequences of what we've gotten ourselves into. And that's more of Sarah's story and how she handles this. Now, if we go back into Genesis 16, when everything actually starts to happen, this is before Sarah's name is changed to Sarah and she's still Sarai. Um, but she gives Hagar to Abraham and Hagar becomes Abraham's wife. And then she has Hagar, that is, has a baby. And it says that when Hagar conceived and saw that she had conceived, her mistress was despised in her eyes. And that implies that Hagar kind of got the big head, that she was like, oh, I'm able to have a baby, and then she didn't like Sarah. That could also be taken as she agreed to it, but then when she got pregnant, maybe she had second thoughts. Maybe she didn't want to be pregnant after all, and now she was upset because she agreed to do this thing for her mistress, and now she was pregnant, and she didn't actually want to be pregnant. It doesn't really say um, which way this was is meant to be taken but considering the fact that having children was a a station it, it was a it was considered an honor we see this again the best parallel between Sarah and Hagar is looking at Rachel and Leah and Bilhah and Zilpa and you see that there's this kind of rivalry for who can have the most kids and who can have sons and who can have the most sons. And so given that context and how society functioned, the most likely thing is that Hagar was like, ha, I'm, I'm having the baby. I'm going to have the first son, right? Because the first son usually is the one who inherits, it, inherits everything. So I think Hagar was kind of like, I have surpassed you. I'm no longer the second wife. I am the better wife. And that is what started the friction between Sarah and Hagar. And um, Abraham kind of weaseled himself out of it and was like, well, it's your handmaid. I'll give her back to you. And this is how Hagar basically got demoted back into a handmaid as opposed to staying in the position of a wife. And there was, you know, a very harsh treatment of Hagar by Sarah to the point that Hagar runs away and then as Hagar runs away God comes to her and, and gives her this promise that he will also take care of her and her child that he will make her child you know into a great nation as well you know there's some other things about what will happen to Ishmael but he basically convinces Hagar to go back and, you know, to tough it out and, and, you know, gives her a promise as well. Which brings me to the things that I find very interesting about the story of Hagar. I think in the story of Hagar, we learn a lot about God. I think it reveals a lot about him and his character and about who he is. So one of the first things that I always notice is that God actually comes to Hagar and he actually talks to Hagar. Hagar was not a Hebrew. Hagar was not a descendant of uh, Abraham. He was, she was not part of quote unquote the chosen. She wasn't even a descendant of Shem. She was a descendant of Ham. She was an Egyptian. But God still cared about Hagar. When Hagar fled, God went with her when that was the first time when Hagar is cast out God still goes with her um, he comes to her every time she cries and responds and gives her some measure of comfort in fact this is one of the first ways we see God being comforting which is very interesting because again it's not to someone that's in the promised lineage it is someone who is external to this. And I think that's important. Um, another thing is that 
God was kind of on everybody's side in the story. I think a lot of times we think of God as choosing this side over that side. And so then he does what's best for me. And then he causes harm for my enemy. But if you look at what happens, you know, there's friction happening. It's, you know, it's what we would call today a blended family. And there's a little bit of drama um, going on. The women don't really get along, which is not anything new. There's nothing new under the sun. And so Sarah is asking Abraham to essentially send Hagar away. Abraham goes to God and is like, what do I do? Like, I don't want to do that. And God is like, yeah, you know, I think it's time. Go ahead, send, send Hagar away. Then Hagar is in the wilderness thinking that she's going to die and crying out. And, and God comes to Hagar and is like, no, 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 no. I'm going to take care of you and your son. Everything's going to be okay. This is what's going to happen. So God did what he thought was best for everyone in the situation. He created an environment of peace. And even though it may have felt like to, ha to Hagar, it may have felt like he took Sarah's side. And a lot of times we read it, it, se it sounds like he took Sarah's side, but he didn't. Really, he tried to do what was best for everybody and send, and he sent his angels to comfort Hagar, right? So it, it wasn't like he just cast her out and left her to die. It wasn't a punishment. It was how do we balance things? Because human beings have made things messy and complicated. How do I straighten this out so that everybody is safe, everybody is happy, everybody is cared for? And that's the solution that came up. Um, within that, there's also this other revelation about how the decisions in the marriage of Abraham and Sarah were functioning. So Sarah asks Abraham something and Abraham doesn't like it. Abraham does not want to send Hagar and Ishmael away. He loves his son and he wants his son to stay with him. So Abraham consults God. He's like, you know, Sarah wants this thing of me, but I don't really want this, what should I do? And then God tells Abraham to listen to his wife. And I think it's important to point this out because we always focus on the whole wives submit to your husband, but we forget about the fact that the husband is supposed to be consulting God about what is happening and, and what direction they're supposed to be going in. And in this particular case, we see that it's not just the husband being a dictator and getting what he wants all the time. It is about following God's will and doing what's best for the family as a whole. And in this case, God said that what Sarah said was what was best for the family. And so Abraham ends up doing what his wife asked him to do. So I think that's an important takeaway as well. Um, another thing is that there are blessings that come out of something that is really messy, right? The entire concept of Sarah giving her handmaid as a wife, it, that's a messy concept, right? It, it doesn't seem like it's going to end well. Whether Hagar was super gung-ho or whether she was just kind of roped into it, like it seems like one of those things that you get what you get at the end, right? Like you, you, you think bad things are going to happen because it was a bad idea from the get-go. But Ishmael is actually blessed. He is not cursed. He is blessed. Um, there are some parts that sound like he's going to be a wild man and that sounds a little curse-like. But he ends up having 12 sons who are princes, and his story actually parallels the story of Jacob's children. Um, and I wrote that over here, is that the, the Hagar's son's life parallels the life of the promised son, which is very interesting and comes up repetitively in the New Testament. So there is some spiritual things underlying this story that are really, really important. Another thing that is interesting is that God shows up for Hagar. And throughout the Old Testament, we keep reading that God is the God of the poor. He's the God of the oppressed. He's there to, to bring justice. And that's exactly what we see. He's answering to Hagar, who's, like I said, again, not even part of this so-called promised lineage. She was an outsider. She was a foreigner. She was a servant, right? This is the bottom of the totem pole in social hierarchy in their culture. 
And God is coming to her. God's saying, I'm still here. He's sending angels to her. He's using resources. He is concerned about her. Um, and I think that's important to remember that he cared about Hagar just as much as he cared about Isaac, just as much as he cared about Abraham, just as much as he cared about anybody else in the text. And so <clears throat> remembering that he is, in fact, the God of the poor and the oppressed, and he is demonstrating it. And then finally, I wrote down that miracles often occur in the wilderness. This may be the first miracle that happened in the wilderness, but Hagar is in the wilderness when God comes to her and says that he will save um, them and, and that he will keep them and that they will be okay. And I think it's interesting that people often have to go through their time in the wilderness to achieve whatever it is that God has for them and to develop their relationship with God, to further their relationship with God. And Hagar is no different. She also experiences that. So that being said, um, I definitely think that Hagar is one of the women that we should talk about more often. I think we should look into her story more often. This was definitely just kind of a glance over and a skimming through her story. There is so much more that we could go into. Like I said, there's a lot of spiritual things that connect into the New Testament um, that I think would be interesting. If you have any more things that I left out um, due to time constraints, feel free to leave them in the comment section and talk about other things that you find interesting about Hagar. And let me know if you've heard a lot of sermons preached about Hagar. She is still a fairly popular or well-known female in the Bible. I just feel like she's not talked about as much um, in favor of other people. And I think we should change that. So here's to Hagar as we get really close to Mother's Day. I probably should have waited and released this episode on Mother's Day, but I'm just not that coordinated. So let's pretend that I released this on Mother's Day. Um, happy Mother's Day to those of you out there celebrating um, and uh, best wishes as you enjoy uh, your, your, your families. So... See you guys on the next Breakfast in Bible. Bye.